We're going to read a number of scripture, and I want you to keep your Bible handy, because there's one thing that I want you to see in particular as we thread what we call the Christmas story together. There are so many different individuals and different characters and different things that happen during this time, but I want you to see it on a little bit different light this morning as we talk this morning about Christmas interruptions. Christmas interruptions. So in Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 18, the scripture says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to stop right there, and if you'll give me your attention just for a moment. We have a couple here that no doubt love each other, and they want to spend their lives together. They are not yet to that place in their life where they are going to join together as a couple. That would happen uh, when they get married. So they're ready to join together as a couple. But before that happens, they have a divine interruption. The Bible tells us that the angel came and visited Mary, and the angel told Mary, Mary, <laughs> you have been chosen. And uh, I'm sure that Mary thought, oh boy. The Bible says that Mary, she didn't complain about it. Mary did not respond the way many individuals would have responded. Uh, because a lot of ladies who are engaged to be married, they would say, this can't be happening. Or, why is this happening to me? Or the way some people do when they have fatalistic attitudes, they say this, everything bad always happens to me. But Mary didn't say that. The Bible says that she pondered these things in her heart. But here's a couple that uh, they are preparing to get married, and amid these preparations to get married, they have a divine interruption. A child. That's a big one, isn't it? The Bible says she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now we know that the child was sent by God. We know that the timing was perfect. We know that everything about Jesus being born through Mary to be born in Bethlehem was all precisely God's doing. But nevertheless, it is for this couple a divine interruption. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, which means privately. But while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Here we have another interruption. Joseph here is thinking about maybe what his plan is going to be. Maybe he's already started to formulate some things in his mind and he's rolling some things around in his head thinking, okay, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to explain this to my family? Uh, do I take uh, Mary's word for this? We know that there must have been some doubt as to that in his mind because he receives a divine confirmation from the angel saying, hey, don't worry, this is all legitimate. It's all God's plan, but here we have another interruption in Joseph's life. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he, Jesus, shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. And Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, I don't know what Mary and Joseph's 
plans were for naming their child. Have you ever thought of that? And boy, that seems to be on front and big scale today. Naming your child. And maybe they had thought, well, we're going to call, uh, when we have children, uh, our child's going to be little Joseph. Uh, guess what? Uh, somebody had already tasked uh, the, what their first child would be, and it would be Jesus. Then notice in chapter number 2, in verse number 1, where the Bible says this, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. If we read this all the way through, we're going to see again another divine, what's the word? Say it with me. Interruption. Herod seems to be fairly in control of his domain and everything seems to be going Herod's way. And out of nowhere, three uh, not three, these wise men show up in his city making a noise. And the Bible says that in verse number three, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, comma, read with me to the end of the verse, and all Jerusalem with him. So not only is Herod the king troubled, but all of the city of Jerusalem is troubled with this, say it with me, divine Interruption. He said, what is this? What's the meaning of this? And we know, again, this was in keeping with God's plan. And uh, then I think about these wise men. The Bible says they came to, Ju to Jerusalem. But these wise men, they had been back in their country. And they're studying the heavens and they see a star. And they say, whoa, we've never seen the likes of this before. And when we got out our heavenly charts, none of what we saw in the heavens lines up with what we know about the stars. There is something here. That according to the behavior of these men, we know that they had to have consulted with the scriptures. And they added up the time frame of the weeks of Daniel, we believe. And they said, wow, there's something extraordinary happening. We have to go see this. So we don't know exactly who these men are, where they're at before they came to Jerusalem. We really don't know a lot about them when they left. But we do know this, that these men had something happen in their life that was very clearly a, say it with me, a divine interruption. Now you say, Pastor, you really seem to be stressing this point. Oh, we haven't gotten started yet. I want you to go to the book of Luke. Chapter number one. We're in verse number five. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. And they had no child uh, because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without the time of incense. And we have Zacharias. He's holding a church service. That's what's happening. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord. Folks, what is this? Say it with me. It's a divine interruption. And I can't think that many times we're as flexible as what some of these saints were. You know, he didn't say, hey. Can you get back with me in about an hour? Because now is a really bad time. The Bible tells us now he is in the middle of this church service. People are waiting for him to come out. And he can't come out. And then when he does come out, he can't speak. And it just seems like it monkeyed the whole thing up. On top of that, they're going to have a baby. I want you to keep going in the book of Luke. 
at verse number 1 of chapter 2. Are you ready? We're in Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Let's keep going. Verse number three. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Read these next four words with me. Being great with child. And it, uh, it appears that it is not an option for Mary to stay behind. Oh, great! This is all we need. And it just doesn't really on a human level seem like this is a really good idea. I've heard about ladies who are expecting uh, going and riding over railroad tracks to speed things along. I'm sure that a long trip on a donkey uh, would be helpful, but not comfortable. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And we look at this and the timing of it and we say to ourselves, this is awful. But we have to understand that this is a divine Interruption. A divine interruption. If we were to go down and read verses 8 down through verses 20, we would see that we have a bunch of, a bunch of shepherds that are laying out in the fields. Uh, very commonly thought that they are during lambing season. And they're just out there minding their business, tending their flocks. And the angels... Come and start singing and light up the night sky where they're at. And another, say it with me, divine interruption. Over and over and over again in the scripture we see that this first Christmas is just full of what we would consider out of the ordinary, not the usual, not what we would expect would have happened, not what anybody expected, but divine interruptions. Then the Bible tells us, I want you to see it, in verse number 21 of chapter 2. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb and the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished and they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Baby dedication of sorts. And behold, verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed to him, unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit. The Spirit gets this old man and says, Get up, Simeon. It's time. It's time to go to the temple. And the Holy Spirit of God moves this man to the temple and this man who must have been at peace somewhere is brought to the temple. Another divine interruption. And Mary and Joseph, they bring the child Jesus in and they're going to be an offering that they give and there's going to be a dedication uh, to the Lord because he's the firstborn child and there's some special things that surround that and a lot of uh, felicity is surrounding that event as well. And here they go into the temple, just kind of do their thing with the priest 
and they get interrupted by two people, Simeon and Anna. We say, what's all this? More? I think by now Mary's saying, I'm so used to this. I'm used to these divine interruptions. Or she could have said, that's not how it's supposed to go. Here we're just trying to have a baby dedication. And everything went badly. I want you to see just some of the wording. I think sometimes we're so used to reading this that we lose sight of it. And Simeon blessed them. Got to give a blessing to the baby, okay? Now God bless you. Oh, you're, you must be so happy. I'm so happy for you. Is this your first baby? Oh, or is he have a brother or sister at home waiting? Oh, first one? Oh, God bless you. It's so special. I remember our first child. And these are the kind of things that people say when they, when they see a child. Not this one. I want you to see it. Let these words bless you. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall... <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Baby dedication. Aren't these special words? Is that what you would write in a card? Probably not. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. And you think, wow. Wow. Divine interruptions. Now you say, Pastor, what's, what's all this about? Because oftentimes, when we think about the time of the Savior's birth, and we look forward to it, we think about having everything in harmony. We think about maybe an ideal setting where we share a meal, or we get everybody together, and we open gifts. And we think that everything is in order, and everything is the way that it should be. But we understand that according to the Scripture, this first Christmas was a Christmas of interruptions. But they were not just interruptions, they were divine interruptions. And there's several things that I'd like to lay on you this morning, and that is this. First of all, I would like us, as we go into the next few weeks, whenever we have these events that happen, I would like us to see interruptions as divine events. I would like us, first of all, to see interruptions as divine events. Now, here is the benefit that we have when we look at the Scripture. The benefit that we have is we can look at the story of Jesus Christ and we can look at the birth of Jesus and we can read the whole scope of everything that happened and all the individuals that were involved in it, whether it be Zacharias and Elizabeth or whether it be Simeon and Anna or Herod the king or whether it be uh, these wise men that came from the east or the story of their betrothal and then the child being born while they were engaged. And we look at all of this and we just say, isn't this wonderful? Isn't it incredible how God in his perfect timing made all of these things to work perfectly so that the scriptures could be fulfilled so that we could have a savior and we can be excited about the events that brought us Jesus but let one little thing in our life go a little bit off and we get upset so the first thing that I'd like to challenge us with is I would like us to begin to see interruptions as divine events. See interruptions as, say it with me, divine events. Did it ever occur to you that nothing occurs to God? And I was feeling it this morning a little bit. I thought, I, I don't want to cancel Sunday school, but I think it's the proper thing to do. Uh, if we hadn't, I don't think that we'd had everything shoveled out and ready to open for church. And Jesus Christ, in shame and agony in the garden, knowing what he would endure, you know what Jesus said? He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. It is so hard for us when things don't go our way. First of all, see interruptions as a divine event. Number two, what I'd like us to do 
when we have these divine interruptions in our life, I would like us to calm our hearts and minds. Look in the book of Colossians, chapter number 3. I'd like you to see it. Yesterday, I went over to David and Deborah Joy's house. I was so excited to be able to work with David on a little project. And uh, I was a little nervous about it before we started. It's this way when you jump into a project and you don't know, is this going to be a three or four hour project or is it going to be a two day project? And as the Lord would have it, it went very well. And uh, I, I was looking at what time it was and it was beyond what time is normally lunch. And I thought, you know, uh, we're just going to keep going until we got it finished. And I grabbed a little bit of snacks. Uh, out of David's fridge, but you have to remember David is a bachelor. And so he only has bachelor food in his fridge. And uh, so it snacked a little bit, and then we got it all done and praise the Lord, uh, got, the, got the water back on, and we didn't have any leaks, and I was so excited. I thought, this is wonderful. So I uh, gave Sherry a call and said, hey, I'm on my way home. And it just in my mind, what I had pictured was I was going to go home and make a cup of coffee and get my feet up for uh, just a few minutes and enjoy my cup of coffee. And when I got home, it did not go anything like that. And the cup of coffee that I was going to have was at least two, maybe three hours after I got home. Because things don't always go the way we plan them. But things go perfectly in harmony with what God's timing is. And notice what the book of Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 15 says. The Bible says this. I think that I am in the wrong place. The scripture, and please don't look for it. Uh, we'll keep moving. Paul told the church that they should allow the peace of God to rule their minds and hearts. To rule their minds and hearts. So I think number two, when things do not go the way that we think they ought to go, that we should be in the habit of calming our hearts and calming our minds. And we can pray something like this, Lord, uh, today is not going the way I thought it would go. But Lord, I want your peace to rule my mind and my heart. Sometimes we feel that feeling uh, coming up inside of us. We have this plan and we're trying to work it and this plan's not going, but then we think we can still salvage the plan. Right? We say, God, we know this is a divine interruption. But in the back of our mind, we're thinking, I can still make my plan work. And then we realize that your plan is not going to work and never was going to work to begin with. It was failed from the beginning. And we can feel that rising inside of us. And Paul said that we ought to let the peace of God rule our hearts and our minds. And I know that there's a lot of folks as they're looking at uh, Christmas season and different things. They're thinking, this is not what I want. This is not what I plan. Things are not going the way I want them to go. We see interruptions as divine events. We calm our minds and our hearts with the Lord's peace. Number three, be willing to give God glory. Be willing to give God glory. I'll not have you turn there, but in the book of Daniel, chapter number two, the Bible gives us a story of a king. And this king was in the habit of receiving glory unto himself. This was this man's plan. He had a big statue uh, built to himself. He was very puffed up. And the end of the story shows us that God took this man and he humbled him in an incredible way. And through all of this, the Lord made it very clear that the problem was that this man, this king, was not willing to give God glory. So what does God do? Sometimes when we're not willing to give God the glory in our life, what the Lord will do is the Lord will humble us 
and put us in a position where we can look only to the Lord and then anything that happens must be of the Lord and we're willing then to give God the glory. Oftentimes I'll say this as I pray and I'm not saying it as rhetoric. I hope you don't think it's that. But I say it on purpose as the Lord brings it to my mind. And this is the phrase that I'll often pray because somebody taught me to pray this way. Lord will be very careful to give you the praise and the glory. Sometimes when people go into surgery and we pray and we say, Lord, this is what we would like. We ask for this. You invited us to. But sometimes we know that surgery doesn't go the way we want it to go. <laughs> we ask the Lord when there's recovery, Lord, recovery after surgery. This is what we pray for and this is what we would desire. And we know that you're a good father and you desire good gifts for your children. But we know, Father, that sometimes things do not go according to the way we think things ought to go. And Lord, if our plan is different than your plan, that really doesn't matter because you're God and you'll do what God does anyways. But we ask you, Lord, to make us willing no matter what happens to give you the glory. It's unthinkable for us. For Kara to not have a child by New Year's. But if it happens to be New Year's, whatever it is, we give God the glory. And then the last one is this. Are you ready? Don't cave to anger and perfectionism. Don't cave to anger and perfectionism. Oftentimes the anger comes because things don't go the way we want them to go. Sometimes anger comes because things don't go the way we plan them to go. And I know one thing the Lord has had to teach me personally, and that is this. That we ought to plan. But we also always ought to have room for God to have His will and His way. There's a little chorus we sing. Let the Lord have His way in your life every day. There's no rest, there's no peace until the Lord has His way. And we love singing that song. I love that song. Until the Lord has to have His way in my life and it's different than the way that I have planned. Don't cave to anger and perfectionism. What perfectionism does is perfectionism decides ahead of time how everything will go. And let's be honest, so oftentimes our plans and God's plans don't mesh. And so oftentimes I have to remind myself, God, you're in control. This is what I plan, but obviously I'm not on the same page. We're not aligned. And rather than fuss with the Lord, I've learned to not be angry and allow the Lord to have His way. You ever watch a child throw a tantrum when they don't get their way? Uh, we're kind of observing some things as our children have their children and their children are getting a little bit older and a little more aware. And I was reminded again of how children fuss when they don't get their way. And sometimes it's cute, sometimes it's alarming. You say, whoa, whoa, at that age. Yes, at that age. And then I remind myself how awful it must be to our Heavenly Father when I fuss that way, when I don't get my way. The first Christmas. That story is full of, what's the word? Divine interruptions. The whole thing. From the birth of John the Baptist all the way through to the death of Jesus. What parent wants to attend the burial of their child? That's what Mary went through. The whole story through and through is one of divine interruptions, but a beautiful story of redemption brought to us by God the Father. I hope that we are very cognizant of the fact that God's will, God's way, His timing, the plan of redemption laid out in the life of Jesus.